Hey there, I'm Michael from CodeCloud. Welcome to this lesson from our AWS Cloud Practitioner Certification Course. In this video, we'll help you build a strong foundation in cloud computing with AWS. So if you wanna learn more or go deeper, check out the full course details below and let's get started. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about networking within AWS. So when we went over the basics of AWS, we learned that when we deploy our application onto AWS, it's going to be running on the same exact infrastructure that all of the other customer applications are running on. So our application is running on the same exact infrastructure that everyone else's applications are running on. Now, does that mean that all of the other customers that use AWS could potentially communicate with our application? Does that mean that they have access to our application? Because that could be a little bit of a security concern. So obviously Amazon thought about this and they made sure that this wouldn't be an issue because we just can't have our applications be exposed to everyone else's applications. So when you actually deploy onto AWS, what happens is AWS essentially gives you your own mini private cloud and every customer gets their own private cloud and each of these clouds are completely isolated from one another. So by default, they cannot talk to each other. And since they can't talk to each other, it allows us to have a secure environment where we know that nobody else can interfere with our application or potentially um, have backdoor access to it. And these private clouds that each customer gets is referred to as a virtual private cloud or VPC for short. So this is kind of the networking construct within AWS that ensures that every customer has their own isolated environment. So let's dive into VPCs. Now, as I mentioned, a virtual private cloud is a secure, isolated network segment hosted within AWS. And the whole purpose of the VPC is to isolate resources from other resources. So it isolates our resources from other customers' resources. And the great part about VPCs is that they give the customer full control of networking within the cloud. So just like you would have in a on-prem data center where you have your switches um, or your routers and you would configure all of the routing um, and all of the rules and policies, within AWS, the same thing happens. So you get access to um, all of the subnetting and IP addresses. So you get to decide what IP addresses are assigned to what uh, you know applications or hosts. You have access to routing within there. So you get to decide how packets traverse through your AWS environment. You have um, access to various firewalls or firewall concepts within AWS, like NACLs and security groups. And you have access to gateways, which are kind of responsible for uh, making sure traffic is allowed uh, to enter from the internet into your cloud environment, as well as uh, resources from within your cloud can then talk to the internet. So at this point, you might have the same exact question that I had when I first started learning AWS, which is, does that mean every customer gets exactly one VPC and that's going to perform the one main operation of uh, making sure that your infrastructure is isolated from other people's infrastructures? Uh, not exactly. In fact, you can have more than one VPC. Within your AWS account, you can actually create multiple VPCs. And the way you structure your VPCs is ultimately up to you as the customer, but potentially you could have one VPC for each one of your environments. So you could have one for your development environment, one for your staging environment, one for your production environment, or you could even segment it out so that each one of your different applications could have their very own VPC. So application one has its own VPC, application two has its own VPC. It's ultimately up to you as the cloud designer to figure out how you want to kind of segment out your AWS account to ensure that only the right devices are able to have access to other devices within your cloud environment. So the point I want to highlight is that yes, VPCs do help customers segment out their, their cloud infrastructure from other customers, but on top of that, they also help you segment it out within your own organization. You could potentially break it out so that, you know, your development team gets their own VPC, uh, your finance team gets their own VPC. It's really up to you. You have a lot of flexibility in the cloud and AWS has designed it so that you can kind of architect your cloud environment in any way that you would like. So how exactly do VPCs and regions kind of interoperate? Because we learned that regions are, you know, locations across the globe where we can deploy our applications onto AWS infrastructure. So how do they kind of fit together? Well, let's say you have a region, either US East 1, US East 2, it doesn't really matter what region is. The important thing to understand is a VPC 
is specific to a single region. So when you create a VPC, you're saying, I want a VPC in um, the North American region, or I want a VPC in uh, the Australian region. So a VPC is going to encompass only resources that can be deployed to the specific region that it's assigned to. So VPCs really, um, I think the main idea I want to kind of hammer home is that VPCs act as a network boundary. So things in one VPC by default cannot talk to other devices or resources in other VPCs. By default, they are configured to kind of restrict access so that they're isolated and protected. Now, you can configure things to be able to talk to other things in other VPCs, but you have to explicitly configure that. By default, they act as a network boundary, though. The next thing that I want to talk about is called a subnet. So within your VPC, you create subnets. And a subnet is nothing more than a group of IP addresses within your VPC. So you can see here subnet one has the IP address range of 172.16.0.0/24, and subnet two has the IP address range of 172.16.1.0/24. And when you actually go to deploy, um, well, I, I guess we haven't learned this yet, but like an EC2 instance or a virtual machine onto AWS, you're actually going to deploy it onto a specific subnet. It's going to fall within that IP address range. They're, they're going to get an IP address from that specific range. And the important thing to understand about subnets is um, a subnet resides within a single availability zone. So subnet one exists within availability zone one and subnet two exists within availability zone two. So when you go to create a server in AWS, you're going to tell it what subnet you want it to be on. And that's going to determine what availability zone that server exists on. So the important thing I want you guys to remember is a subnet is a group of IP addresses and a subnet resides within a single availability zone. And that's going to determine where you deploy resources and what availability zones they're gonna fall into based off of the subnet that you're associated with. When you create a subnet, you can create both private and public subnets. And so the difference between the two is going to determine, you know, what is the external access towards that subnet. So a private subnet would be a subnet that isn't exposed to the internet, so either Either the internet can't talk to resources within that subnet or that subnet can't talk to uh, the internet directly either. And so this would be great for things like maybe like a database that doesn't need external connectivity, only applications within that are running within AWS need to talk to the database. So it doesn't necessarily need to be on a public subnet. You can have it be a little bit more secure by being on a private subnet so that nobody is able to access it over the internet. Whereas in the public subnet, you can host your web server, which is meant to be public so that users can actually access the web server. Uh, and so every subnet can be configured to be public or private. It's up to you depending on how you want to set it up. Now, when we're talking about the different deployment models with you know, the cloud, you have we talked about the hybrid deployment model where you have a mix of physical infrastructure um, as well as infrastructure in the cloud. So what you could do is if you have a physical data center, you can actually make it so that your cloud environment and your VPC acts as an extension to your physical data center. And you can connect your data center uh, to the VPC using a VPN. Now, when you create a VPC, you have to specify a range of IP addresses that that VPC can use. And this range of IP addresses is called a CIDR block. So when you create that VPC, you might give it a, a CIDR block of 192.168.0.0/16. That means that any resources that get deployed on this VPC is going to use an IP address from that range. You cannot use an IP address outside of that range. And when you create a CIDR block, you have to use a range of somewhere between slash 16 to a slash 28. And if you use the 192.168.0.0/16, that's going to give you all of the IP addresses from 192.168.0.0 all the way through 192.168.255.255. So the important thing I want to highlight is CIDR block is just a range of IP addresses that resources in a VPC will use. Um, and resources cannot get IP addresses um, outside of this range. Now, when we create subnets, remember, subnets are a range of IP addresses that get deployed within a VPC. We have to make sure that subnets within a VPC also have to be within the CIDR range. So if I create a subnet like one, uh, subnet one, which is using 192.168.10.0 slash 24, this is going to fall within this CIDR range. So that's allowed. However, subnet two uses the 10.100.1.0 slash 24 range, which is not in the CIDR block range. And so that's not going to be allowed. 
And so for subnet block sizes, the other thing to remember is that um, they must be between a slash 16 and a slash 28. So both for VPC cider blocks as well as subnet block sizes, uh, they're going to have to be between a slash 16 and a slash 28. Now, I don't know what everyone's background is from a networking perspective. I know a lot of people aren't too strong with networking. If you are familiar with networking, there is some uh, other differences that I want to highlight between, you know, a subnet in the cloud versus your subnet in your usual data center. And that is that AWS actually re reserves a couple of extra IP addresses. So the first four IP addresses of a subnet are reserved and cannot be used. So 192.168.10.0 slash 24. Let's say we grab that range. The 10.0 is going to be the network address. We can't use that. Um, and then dot one through dot three is reserved for AWS as well. So the first four addresses are gone. And then on top of that, if you know from just basic networking, uh, the last IP address of a subnet is reserved for the broadcast address, which cannot be used. So remember the first four addresses and the last address within AWS cannot be used for any resources or for any servers deployed onto AWS. And so if we deploy a server onto subnet one, it's going to, the first address it can use is going to be the 192.168.10.4 because remember, um, dot zero through dot three is going to be taken. So that's going to be the first address. The next server could get the dot five and the dot six and so on. So when you create a subnet first within AWS, that subnet by default is going to be a private subnet. So it's not going to be exposed to the internet. You will not be able to access it from the internet. And this is kind of meant to be as a security measure because you don't want to accidentally expose um, any of your, you know, your resources out to the internet if they don't need to be. And so you have to explicitly change it to a public subnet to actually give it access to the internet. And so to make a private subnet public, we have to make use of something called an internet gateway. So an internet gateway uh, is assigned to a VPC and it allows subnets in a VPC to communicate with the internet and vice versa, right? So really the internet gateway determines whether a subnet is public or private. And I want you to keep in mind the internet gateway isn't assigned to a subnet, it's assigned to the VPC, but it's a matter of giving a subnet access to the internet gateway is going to determine if that subnet is private or public. Now there is another tool to provide internet connectivity for subnets to make them um, act public. And the other one is called a NAT gateway. So it's a little bit different than an internet gateway. Um, the names kind of sound similar because they both have the word gateway, but I want you to understand for the exam, they're not the same thing and the behavior is a little bit different. So with a NAT gateway, the important distinction is a connection must be initiated from within the VPC. So NAT gateway gives your internal resources access to the internet, but they have to initiate the connection. So if the internet tries to send a request to your private subnet, it's gonna block it. However, if your private subnet sends a request out to the internet and gets a response, it's going to allow it. So the important distinction is internet gateway allows either side to initiate the connection, but a NAT gateway expects the connection to always originate from the private subnet. So with NAT gateways, um, just to kind of give you a very simplified overview of how it works, what's going to happen is you're going to have your internet gateway that's associated with the VPC. So any public subnets will, they're going to be public if you give them access to the internet gateway. But to actually make use of the NAT gateway, you still need the internet gateway. But what's going to happen is you're going to deploy the NAT gateway onto a public subnet which is going to give it access to the internet gateway. And so your private subnet, anytime they need to talk to the internet, they'll send that request to the NAT gateway. The NAT gateway will send it to the internet gateway, and then the request will go out to the internet, and then you'll get the response back in the opposite direction. So keep in mind, anytime you wanna use the NAT gateway, you still need the internet gateway to provide that connectivity out of the cloud. Now, when you wanna to talk to or connect to resources within a private subnet, obviously they don't have connection to the internet, so you won't be able to connect to them, but you still need a way to securely connect to them so that you can make configuration changes, monitor them, manage them however you need to. And so this is where um, the virtual private gateways or VPN gateways come into play. So we can make use of a VPN gateway to actually give us uh, secure access to private resources or resources deployed onto a private subnet. And the thing about a VPN gateway is it's going to provide us a VPN connection over the internet. So we connect to the VPN gateway over the internet, over our usual ISP, 
to have a secure and encrypted connection to our private subnets. And the important thing I want you guys to understand is that this encrypted connection, even though it's encrypted and safe and nobody will be able to read it, it is technically going over the internet. And that's what I want to highlight because when we go over the other method of connecting to private resources, it's going to be a little bit different. It's not going to be going over the internet. So remember virtual uh, private gateways, VPN gateways, they allow secure connections to private resources over the internet encrypted. Now, the other way of connecting to AWS and private resources is by using Direct Connect. Now, Direct Connect is a little bit different because what's going to happen is that you as a customer will actually have to go to this specific location called a DX location or a Direct Connect location, and you have to physically connect your, um, you know, your router or whatever you need to to that specific location. And what this location does is it has a direct high-speed connection to AWS regions. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to securely access your resources within AWS through this direct connect location. So instead of going over the internet, you have a direct and secure high speed link to that location. So you're going to have low latency and more importantly, you're going to have consistent latency because you're not using the internet, you're using the direct connect location. So let's quickly summarize everything that we've covered in this video. So we learned about VPCs, which are just um, a construct within AWS that allows us to isolate computing resources from other computing resources within the cloud. Uh, and keep in mind that you are allowed to have more than one VPC per account. Uh, you can create multiple VPCs to kind of segment out your, uh, your cloud infrastructure. Now, VPCs are specific to a region. So when you create a VPC, it's going to get deployed in a specific region that you define. Um, a VPC is going to have a CIDR block, which is going to define the IP address range that any resources deployed in the VPC can use. Subnets are a range of IP addresses within a VPC. And subnets are going to reside within a single availability zone. And so when you go to deploy a server or any other resource, you're going to specify what subnet you want to deploy it on. And that's going to determine what availability zone they ultimately get deployed on because a subnet can only be associated with one availability zone. Subnets can be made public or private by making use of internet gateways or NAT gateways. And remember, by default, they're going to be private subnets until you um, give them access to one of the gateways, which will then allow them to be public subnets. Uh, internet gateways allow subnets to communicate with internet and vice versa. NAT gateways will allow subnets to talk to the internet, but the important distinction is that connections must be initiated from within the VPC. They cannot be initiated from the internet. Virtual private gateways enable secure access to private resources over the internet. So remember, we're sending encrypted traffic over the internet. And Direct Connect um, uses a direct connection into AWS regions that provide low latency and high speeds because you don't have to go over the internet. If you're ready to take your cloud skills to the next level, don't miss our complete AWS Cloud Practitioner certification course on CoCloud. With hands-on labs, interactive games, and all the guidance you need to ace the exam, you'll be well on your way to certification. So click the link below to join the course today.